Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and get started here. The first of our panelists that I want to introduce to you is immediately <laughs> to my right, um, Casey Delahente. I hope I'm pronouncing uh, correctly, is a student here at FSU and has been a, a leader in this fight and, um, as you saw, was featured in the film. And uh, Casey, I'll just turn it over to you and, uh, and uh, let you talk a bit about the work that you've been doing here at FSU. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so as you saw, I think my hair was a little longer, I suppose, then. but um, yeah, I was, uh, was in that mainly uh, from back in May, at about, the, about the same time that uh, Damien was doing some of his work. Uh, I, along with a couple other students, Ralph uh, was one of the ones out there with us, um, stage a protest here at, uh, at the university um, that, you know, we ran across campus a little bit and made a little noise, um, and, you know, I like to think that played some small role and at least bring some uh, attention to it, some light to it. Um, and from there, it's uh, basic, um, I, I suppose, sort of support and everything like that uh, towards uh, the efforts going on uh, at student government right now uh, in the referendum. So it's, uh, it's about where I'm at. <laughs> Casey, do you want to talk a little bit about the referendum process? Um, sure. Well, um, <laughs> honestly, I mean, I, I, I don't feel completely, I like the most, I'm certainly not the most qualified person for him to talk about the referendum itself. Um, but it, uh, it's a show of uh, uh, the, the wording is escaping me right now. Um, do, you, do you have the wording of that, yeah. Ralph? Yeah, I do, actually. Uh, it, it reads, uh, we the students of Florida State University stand with President Barron and the faculty senate in opposition to the infringement on academic freedom as established uh, by the agreement between the Charles G. Koch Chair Foundation and the FSU Economics Department. Exactly. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, to stay in opposition um, as a student body uh, against kind of disagreement and agreements like that in the future, hopefully. Um, and that's kind of the point. I mean, in, in the, the way to stop these kind of agreements is as students to kind of be active within our academic community and bring these kind of things to life. Um, I, I know myself, honestly, I, I had just heard about it through uh, some newspaper articles and it kind of got to me as, but I, I guess, a student and a, a lecturer or whatnot here, like, my job here is, is in part to, to produce research and to, and to, at the same time, to gain education. And I think that agreements such as that with the Koch brothers devalues both of those, right? It devalues the integrity of the research that I and other colleagues here at the university produce and he values the quality of education that I and my fellow classmates receive um, in that both in, in the quality of classes given for uh, as a direct result of uh, the Koch Foundation grant and also in that our, our degrees are often worth only as much as they are perceived to be worth in that, in that way that academic degrees tend to be. Uh, and, and agreements like this, especially when they receive as much publicity as they as it did, rightly so, um, tend to chip away at that, at that integrity and that perceived value of our uh, degrees as FSU students. Great. Thanks, Casey. Um, we're going to have plenty of time, I think, for questions and discussion at the end, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce our next panelist, um, Jeff Wright, uh, with the Black Jacket, um, is uh, the Director of Public Policy for the Florida Education Association. Um, Jeff is an educator. He's uh, worked in public education and as an advocate for public schools for, um, for many, many years. And I can tell you from firsthand experience uh, working with him that he's been an absolute champion for, uh, for public education in Florida for as long as I can remember working in Florida politics, which is a very long time now, and uh, and he's also a huge FSU fan. I've been his, in his office, and uh, it's uh, wall to wall um, FSU memorabilia, and uh, so um, so he's a great person to have here tonight, uh, Jeff. Thanks, Damien. Um, yeah, I'm glad I didn't tell you when I graduated because most of you were not even thought of much less I uh, appreciate you coming out, taking time tonight to listen to us to rant on a little bit about what's going on. Um, I did graduate from FSU a long time ago. It was not an ed major, ended up teaching for a whole host of reasons, and I taught middle school for 24 years. And those of you who have been through that thing called middle school, junior high, yeah, you have to be crazy to teach you at that point in your life. And it was fun. I enjoyed it. still do. 
Um, my job at the union is to, we have 140,000 members in this state from uh, 65 different counties. We aren't in two counties, one doesn't do collective bargaining, the other is independent. But every other county, we have offices there, we have members there. This is a right to work state, so you can't be made to join a union, you choose to join. And people choose to give us $600 a year to be part of this organization. And we get really upset with this legislature that's constantly trying to say that they need to protect teachers. They don't need to protect them, they need to let them do their job. So they really asked me tonight to talk a little bit about what I got to witness this summer in New Orleans. My uh, president, Andy Ford, asked me to, uh, would you like to go to this conference in New Orleans? Well, I don't know, think about this conference, didn't matter what it was, it was New Orleans, one of my favorite cities, I'm ready to go. Um, went there many times, it's not that far, most of you know that from here to New Orleans. So, of course, I said yes. He said, well, I want you to go to ALEC. ALEC is the American Legislative Exchange Council. And this group claims to be a, a bipartisan, independent think tank. And we knew they weren't, but we hadn't been to any of their meetings in about the last 10 to 15 years. We just kind of left it alone. So I agreed to go. I thought there were going to be some other folks from other parts of our organization going, but different <coughs> things happened. It ended up, I was the only one from the progressive side who literally was registered in name, not incognito, with who you represented. Now there were 12 other folks part of our group, but they all came as someone else or didn't list who they actually represented. And I thought, well, this should be okay. That lasted a very, very short period of time. After the first three hours, I, from that point on, the entire conference, I had a security person from ALEC assigned to me to make sure I behaved in these meetings. I really don't usually cause that much problem to need my own security guard, but these folks have an agenda. And where the Koch brothers fit in, they're one of the major funders of the organization. Um, they gave $200,000 for the conference in New Orleans, just for the three-day conference. And I'll just use education as an example. First of all, let me read their mission statement. It says, the uh, American Legislative Exchange Council's mission is to advance the Jeffersonian principles of free markets, limited government, federalism, and individual liberty through a nonpartisan public-private partnership among America's state legislators concerned members of the private sector, the federal government, and the general public. To promote these principles by developing policies that ensure the powers of government are derived from and assigned to first the people, then the states, and finally the federal government. Well, that doesn't sound all that bad. Well, let me tell you the practical side of this. <clears throat> they have a whole series of task force, and if you want more information, we can get you to a website that will give all of it to you. But they have task force on various topics, from energy to voter rights to education, and I'm going to talk about the education task force. I knew the corporations across the country were very involved in ALEC, but they are in almost everything, whether it's a democratic organization, Republican organization, they all fund. They wine and dine, they set up hospitality rooms, all that. That's what I'm used to. I go to a lot of conferences where that's the arrangement. Scott knows as a representative how that works too. So that part wouldn't have surprised me. But what we found out at this particular conference, the corporations not only do the whining and dining side, they also sit on these task force. Every task force has a private sector and a public sector. The public sector are elected representatives from various legislatures across the country. Most of the legislators, they claim again to be bipartisan, of the 28 that sit on the board, only two are Democrats, the rest are Republican. And that was the makeup on the public side, and it has the chairperson. Then they have a private sector panel, which is made up of all the corporations. And I mean all of them. You have them from AT&T, Walmart. We said if we did a boycott here, we couldn't do anything, buy anything, go anywhere, even go to the bathroom. Because <laughs> all the corporations are there. So. It's not that it's a certain segment of corporations, and some give a lot more money. It's very expensive for the corporation to be a member of ALEC. It's very cheap for a legislator. And they can get scholarships funded by the corporations to pay their dues. But these two panels meet on every issue, and they vote. And it requires a positive vote by the public sector. 
and a positive vote by the private sector, or the model legislation doesn't go forward. And that's what they're about. They set up model legislation that is then sent to friendly legislators all over the country to move an agenda. And if you've been paying attention over the last several years, you see more and more states in the same fights, particularly doing away with the rights of the working class, to change the university settings, to make it more expensive, more exclusive, so only certain segments of society can get to them. It's by design. They literally put this legislation together. And here's the piece that I was amazed with. If the corporations don't vote in favor, it can't move forward. Now, the same is true on the public side. If the public sector group doesn't vote in favor, it doesn't go forward. But think about these corporations. They are the ones who fund these campaigns of the public sector group. So how many of those public sector are going to go against the corporate influence? Because they know if they do, they won't be funded for their re-election. It was run by the corporations. Prime example, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce on the Education Task Force brought forward a bill that is now passed, it is model legislation, we'll begin seeing it across the country in legislatures, where a high school senior cannot graduate unless he's had a full semester of free enterprise instruction. <laughs> now, they have a curriculum attached to this, and it's not what you would think of a free enterprise curriculum. It's the Koch brothers, what they define as free enterprise. That's the kind of stuff that goes on there. Last year, if you paid any attention to the legislature, there were a lot of anti-union bills. Remember I just told you that we are a right-to-work state, so our folks choose to join us, and they have the right under collective bargaining in this state to what's called payroll deduction. They get paid by their school board, and the school board takes out the union dues, ships it to the union. We've had that since the teacher-wide strike back in the 70s. There was a bill to eliminate payroll deduction. They wanted to do it just for the teacher union, but under the Constitution that we have, they couldn't do it, so it also included police and fire. But they were trying to make sure if they took away collective bargaining of the right to the dues part of this, it would pretty well shut us down was what they were hoping for. Because it's worked in other states. Tennessee, for instance, they did lose the right to payroll deduction this last session. Um, and they have dropped from about 135,000 members to just over 40,000. Because the only other way you can join is to give me your check every pay period or cash. Now think about the state the size of Florida. We have 5,000 school buildings in this state. Think about the logistics of trying to collect that money that way. They know that. That's a quick way to get at you. Because there are only a few organizations in most of the states still standing in front, particularly where one party owns everything. And I'm trying not to just lay it all on the ours. We've got some very good Republican friends in this state. Thank God, or we would be in worse shape because it takes good deeds with this group of moderate Republicans once we get to the Senate to stop the really bad stuff. But that's what they're about. They don't want the voices heard. We stand in their way, and they're after us every session, and have been ever since Jeb Bush was governor. Sometimes the Democrats didn't do great things for public education, but they didn't want out to hurt it. This group has one goal. They want to make sure that they take the public education budget, and I don't mean just K-12, I mean pre-K through K-12, through the university system, and privatize it. There's a bill now to have a virtual university where your entire four years of whatever it takes, you would never go to a campus, you'd never sit in a classroom, it would all be done on the computer. We already have virtual schools for kindergarten. Think about the age of this kid sitting in front of a screen. We have virtual requirement now that every high school graduate must have taken one virtual course. Wouldn't be a bad idea if it's something they needed. How many of you have taken a virtual class? Is it the same as being in an active classroom? It has its place. Remember, virtual was originally designed for rural schools who couldn't offer all the sciences and maths because they didn't have enough student population. So people didn't get cheated out of something. It was never meant as a replacement, and that's what we've gone to now. All that came out of ALEC. Everything that you see in these legislatures, particularly those controlled by just one party, that looks like it's not really 
what you think you thought this country should be about comes from Alec. And they tell these legislators, if you sponsor this legislation, we'll fund your next campaign. They give them scholarships to go to these meetings. The next meeting, just registered for it today, I'm going again. Uh, it's going to be at Amelia Island. So if you want to infiltrate that a little bit, we'll be happy to get you some information and let you come join us. It's an interesting experience. I think that's about enough, Damien. Great right. questions at appropriate point. Thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, in fact, I'm glad that you mentioned that. I, I just got this notice today. I was going to mention this to folks. It's uh, this. They're calling it the Alex K through 12 Education Reform Academy, and it's February 3rd and 4th at the Ritz Carlton in Amelia Island. Um, it says, for invited legislators like you, Alec will cover your room for up to two nights at the host hotel, um, up to $500 in travel expenses, on and on. So. Um, you get the idea. This is just what Jeff was just talking about. If you want to do some interesting um, just research on your own to learn a little bit more about ALEC, um, just, just Google ALEC and private prison industry and immigration reform and see what you find. They were behind um, what's now known as the Arizona-style immigration reform, the, the extreme uh, immigration bill that passed in Arizona that they introduced here in Florida last year. Um, and they are behind all of the big pushes that we're seeing uh, this year here in Florida again for privatiz uh, massive privatization of the prison industry. Um, anyway, some interesting reading if you want to take a look at that. Um, Jeff, thank you again. Uh, I want to introduce next um, Ian Murphy. Uh, Ian is the editor in chief. Um, uh, let's see, native of Buffalo, New York. Well, I'll, I'll let him tell the story, but. Um, uh, first, I want to thank Ian for making a really arduous trip from uh, <laughs> Buffalo to you get to Tallahassee. Um, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, you went from Buffalo to Charlotte, Charlotte to Tampa, and then drove from Tampa to here. So, right. um, so uh, Ian's got a really kind of fun story to tell you, uh, and uh, he came a long way to tell it to you. So uh, I'll just turn it over to Ian and, and uh, let you take it from here. Sure, sure. I mean, before getting into the story of why I really pranked uh, Scott Walker, the governor of Wisconsin, posing as David Koch, you know, Koch brothers, obviously. I think it's fun to kind of just uh, remember the history of the Koch family. Uh, their father, Fred, you know, he co-founded the John Birch Society. These are people who were spreading the idea that fluoridated tap water would make you communist. I'm not kidding. Yeah, that's true. And at the, while he was doing this, he's making his, his fortune making, uh, you know, building oil refineries for Stalin. And it, it's kind of funny to think that both Charles and David continued on in this uh, theme where they're funding insane, you know, Americans for Prosperity, Tea Partier type people while they're, you know, doing business with Iran. It's just really funny how uh, far the, the apple did not fall from the tree. But anyway, so. Uh, you know, just paying attention to the uh, kind of aggressive anti-labor, anti-populist, uh, you know, legislation that Governor Walker was trying to cram through in like February. It, it, uh, my first thought was like, oh, I gotta get this guy, basically. And so, and so my first idea was to uh, pose as Hosni Mubarak, the recently deposed, <laughs> you know, heart to heart, one dictator to another, and just doing a heck of a job. Brownie kind of thing. And uh, I watched some YouTube videos and I just can't do impressions. <laughs> so I went for the be next best thing, having you know some awareness of the Coke uh, connection to Wisconsin. Uh, I, I guess the, the kind of the two straws that broke the camel's back that really made me want to do that were, uh, what was it? The one quote by uh, one of the Wisconsin 14 who had fled the state so this uh, budget repair bill wouldn't go through. Uh, Tim Carpenter, he said, you know, Walker won't talk to us, he won't answer the phone, you know, and I've talked to people who've called him 60 times since, you know, just normal Wisconsin citizens. So I thought, you know, who, who would he take a phone call from? It, and so did you, did you want to play bits of yeah, it? Or? Yeah, let's do it. The, the irony, really, of him like castigating these Democrats for possibly taking money too is at the end of the call he accepts my tr my offer to take him out to Cali. <laughs> that would be great, you know, we'll have a great time. So I didn't mean to cut you off, but it's just like it's so long. And basically, the bullet points are like he he, was, he openly discussed his plans to like trick the Democrats back into session. Uh, he, he he considered planting troublemakers in the crowd. 
And what's funny, not funny, it's kind of terrible, yeah, the reason they decided not to do it is not because it's unethical, it's because he didn't think it would work. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there's, a, there's all sorts of fun little bits in there. If, you have, if you've never listened to it, you should check it out. But uh, it's actually 20 minutes long. And I, I, I called the number on the website having, you know, oh no, I had no <laughs> reasonable expectation that I would get through. So I had absolutely no notes. I had, I had one piece of paper that said C-O-K-E, just so I could say the name phonetically, you know, like, properly. Because I've known about them for a few years, but I've been calling them Koch, you know. Well, they you got did Koch a better job than what I call them. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, as soon as I dropped the magic name, I just got passed up the ladder. And eventually I was talking to uh, his chief of staff, Keith Gilks. And, you know, I, I was using Skype, and I didn't have an online number, so I couldn't get the call in. And, uh, but he, he wanted me to leave my number, so I'm like, oh, damn, what am I going to do? I just, I blurted out, you know, my maid, Maria, she washed my phone. It's broken. I'd have her deported, but she works for next to nothing. And I, I, thought, I thought it was hilarious. It's like we bonded over, uh, you know, racism and lower, lower classes. And so he told me to come back in an hour, and they put me right through. And, you know, it's, it's great because recently uh, Walker finally admitted it was stupid to take this phone call, but he's not that dumb. Because during the call he kind of talks about Wisconsin as this, uh, you know, the first in the series of, you know, Coke dominoes for, the, for uh, the United States. And it really has been a test tube kind of state for the Koch brothers and Alec and Americans for Prosperity and, and every other, uh, you know, tentacle of the Coctopus, as they call it. But, I mean, going back, uh, the, the governor before Walker, Tommy Thompson, and Walker, when they were both uh, state legislators, were uh, active members of ALEC. Uh, the two uh, Walker, excuse me, Fitzgerald brothers, who basically, they control the Senate and the House, uh, respectively, the state house there, the Assembly, uh, they're active members right now of ALEC. And, uh, yeah, and you could just see the, the whole slew of, you know, awful legislation that they've been pushing through this since he got elected. It's just right up the Koch Brothers Alley. So, yeah. <laughs> On that note. Great. Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Ian. Thanks again for, for making such an arduous trip and, uh, <laughs> no problem. and sharing that stuff with us. Um, our last presenter tonight is Representative um, Scott Randolph. He's a Democrat from Orlando. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Scott, I can just also tell you from personal experience, um, is one of the very few champions um, currently or that we have had in a very long time in elected office in the state of Florida and we're just really uh, really fortunate to have him there speaking out on our behalf um, on the floor of the House of Representatives uh, speaking out for um, for the interests of, of real folks like us and so um, I just am very appreciative to have him there and to have him take a few minutes away to uh, come talk with us tonight so Scott take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's like the last of the Mohicans without the Daniel Day-Lewis looks or the soundtrack. So uh, <laughs> that's about what the, the number of progressives that are in the Florida legislature right now. And uh, uh, you know, I, I always like to say that that uh, the Republicans may believe in original sin, but they certainly don't believe in original thought. And uh, you can see that in the Alec legislation that gets filed uh, in the legislature. I mean, it's not only education. <clears throat> if you can think of an issue they have tried to get their tentacles into it, which is why um, you see everything from education issues, the voter suppression laws, uh, to ab abortion bills, to um, any type of corporate bill, the, the drilling, the oil drilling, environmental bills, uh, everything up and down the line. Uh, the Koch brothers, and especially Alec as well, uh, have their fingers in it. And back, in fact, about the only thing I haven't seen a direct uh, connection to Alec has been mo a, a lot of LGBT issues uh, and some of the personhood, but not to uh, let them off the hook there. I mean, but basically the people who fund Alec uh, fund most of those personhood amendments uh, and most of the anti-LGBT uh, legislation you'll see. Uh, everything from uh, the Waltons, uh, who own Walmart, uh, to uh, the owners of the uh, Amway Corporation. What's his name? Uh, the guy that owns the magic. Yeah, yeah, the guy that owns the magic. Totally escaping me. Um, now these, so these people, I mean, so this isn't just business. 
uh, and, and corporate issues, business issues. This is uh, all the social issues that you can think of as well. And you'll see this legislation filed. This model legislation gets filed. These people come back <coughs> from this uh, conference and they automatically file this legislation, which is why we see basically the same bills that get filed throughout the state legislature. And I think what the Koch brothers have, have determined is, even by the way, you always hear, um, you always hear them complain about, oh, the federal government keeps stepping in on the states, and, and we need to take this stuff back to the states. You know why they want to take it back to the states? Because they've bought off most of the states. Uh, and D.C. has gotten too expensive for them to buy off. Uh, so they can come down to the state legislature and do the same thing. Uh, and we're seeing a tremendous amount of their influence in the last decade. I would say their strategy has gone from uh, federal issues down to state issues uh, over the thought and the strategy that they can infiltrate these state legislatures more easily. Uh, and it's worked, quite frankly. I, again, we've seen many, many pieces of, of ALEC legislation, which ironically, of course, is uh, the U.S. Chamber and ALEC wouldn't know the free market if it slapped them in the face. Because if you talk about, oh, let's raise the minimum wage, oh, free market. Uh, child labor, oh, free market. Uh, workers' rights, oh, free market. Uh, but give me a million dollars for a tax incentive. Oh, I need five million dollars to relocate my uh, business to Florida. Oh, I know I'm a, five, a Fortune 500 company, but I need like four million dollars to open up a worthless call center in Tampa. Uh, and so I need your tax dollars to do that. Ironically, I would say that I spend 90% of my time in the legislature watching businesses, ALEC, the U.S. Chamber, the Florida Chamber, big business, try to use government. Uh, to gain an upper hand uh, against their competitor. Uh, so uh, they wouldn't know the free market, uh, again. Uh, they, they are the most anti-free market. Uh, and what I really like to call, if you see most of their legislation, I call it moderate, modern day socialism. And you'll see this in, in most issues. When we, I was just talking about, uh, take PIP. Or take, take the oil spill last summer. Take what they like to do. It's what they like to do, what I like to call modern day socialism, which is they privatize the benefit. So think of all the oil drilling, where they suck up all the profit from the oil drilling. Of course, they just continue to speculate, Goldman Sachs and everybody else speculates on oil prices, and they just drive up oil prices. So they take in all the benefit. And then what happens when there's a spill? Oh, well, you all need to pay for it. Uh, so the taxpayers get, cut, get uh, laid with the cost. And so they privatize the benefit, and they socialize the cost. Uh, it's a beautiful business model for them, and they do it up and down every industry you can possibly find. They take in the benefit, the profits, the CEOs take those profits, and then if there's any, anything that goes on, any, uh, any type of cost, it gets stuck on the taxpayers. I mean, it's amazing to me. You go back, let's, get, let's take Walmart, for, for instance. 2006, I actually got asked this question the other day by, by a Republican reporter, sort of a conservative leader friend of mine. We need to lower the cost of Medicaid. What can we do to, what are you going to do to lower the cost of Medicaid? You know what we should do? We should stop subsidizing low wages. Because if you want to talk about reducing Medicaid costs, you want to talk about getting poor people off Medicaid, why don't you, why don't you talk about a living wage uh, and decent jobs for people? That's how we reduce Medicaid costs. But in 2006, the St. Pete Times had a report that the five largest retailers in Florida cost the state of Florida a billion dollars a year in Medicaid costs. Because their employees are paid so low that their employees still qualify for Medicaid. So look what they've done. They privatized the benefit of low wages for themselves. So for the company, they privatized that benefit. They've driven wages down. And then they've socialized the cost. You and I pick up the cost of health care. You and I pick up the cost of food stamps because of their low wages. It's not just, you know, they want to talk about unemployed people being on food. They're employed people on food stamps because we've driven down wages so much. Uh, and you see that constantly on ALEC. Uh, and so, and yet at the same time, you see, how many times they come to the government for, for subsidies. Uh, and, and straight up taxpayer money. They don't even pretend anymore. They don't even like hide it anymore. Uh, and you've got Governor Rick Scott wanting to hand out $300 million uh, to uh, what's called the, the Office of Economic Opportunity uh, with absolutely zero oversight. The, the department right now says they have no idea what really happened to the last uh, billion dollars we've given to them over the last decade. They can't really say what happened to it. Uh, and yet you've got Rick Scott that wants to double that up. Uh, and here it is, private enterprise, and these big companies coming to take your tax dollars for their own private benefit. Uh, it's quite amazing. And so, you know, I constantly file legislation to try to stop this stuff uh, here in Florida. 
uh, I tried to file, it, going back to um, one of the things with Alec, you'll love this one, talking about the <laughs> gifts and stuff like that. We have an absolute gift fan here in the state of Florida. I literally could not take this pen because uh, Jeff is a registered lobbyist. Uh, an absolute no gift ban whatsoever. Cannot literally eat a muffin from a lobbyist. Um, but they go to the ALEC conference, and not only do they somehow use some type of corporate structure, some type of C3 nonprofit stuff, to give them all these scholarships and pay for their travel and all that, then they set up a dinner, uh, and basically they gave the Republican caucus. Uh, the Republican members, like the, the cost of about a $10,000 dinner, because there was about 25 of them there, the cost of a $10,000 dinner, and they claimed that, oh, no, 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 that money came into the account before the gift ban was issued six years ago, and we've just been holding it over here. Uh, and, of course, the general counsel for the House, who happens to work for the Speaker, obviously, uh, signed off on that deal uh, immediately. So every little turn you... Uh, unfair play that you can think of, uh, and corporate influence that you can think of, uh, the Koch brothers and Alec are involved in. I would really say, uh, you know, a lot of times maybe people speak in hyperbole, but I can't imagine that this is hyperbole. Alec is the biggest threat, uh, and, uh, and with the funding of the Koch brothers and the Waltons and the other big corporations in there with Alec, uh, is the, really the biggest threat to democracy, and certainly democracy at the state level, uh, because they are absolutely uh, taking over uh, these state legislatures. You know, here in Florida, we think of this as being an expensive state, but you've got Mississippi and these tiny little states that are nothing, practically, in campaign contributions. They can just win an entire legislature for absolutely nothing. Uh, and they do it. And, and they've determined that that's their strategy, and I, can, I, I have definitely seen a switch in, in their strategy to come down to the state legislatures uh, and make their influence known here in state. Two follow-ups on some of the things Scott just shared with you. Um, when we were doing the Payroll Protection Act, which was the not allowing you to have dues deduction, when we Dorworth was a sponsor, he'll be the next speaker if he has his way from Seminole County, Sanford area. And we said, this is Alec, absolute Alec legislation. He said he didn't know who Alec was, didn't know anything about him, blah, blah, blah. And we gave the bill that he sent to bill drafting back to him because at the bottom of it said copyright alley. <laughs> they don't have enough damn sense to take the stuff off. You want to talk about this lady. tax break issue? And I'm surprised you may not have seen this yet. Disney is asking for an additional tax break from the state to build a hundred lane bowling alley. Now, if you've been to Disney lately, they're packed. They had to close their doors during the holidays because they had too many people. And the ticket prices have gone pretty sky high. Most of us don't go to Disney because we can't afford it. Walmart doesn't pay taxes in Florida. They're exempt on everything. They pay some in Arkansas, but most of all, sure. So they don't put anything back into the economy. And what Scott outlined to you, every one of you pay for those health care costs for those folks who work at Walmart because they don't qualify for full benefits. That's the system that they want to perpetuate here because the corporations are making fortunes. Great. Thanks, Scott. Jeff, um, I just want to mention a couple quick things and then uh, we'll open it up to some questions. The first one is that I wanted to, how many folks in here are on Twitter? Pretty good amount. Um, I wanted to give folks an opportunity to go and, and to tweet, defend academia, tweet at Ed's show, expose the Koch brothers psycho talk. Um, if, uh, if you're interested in doing that. And I also wanted to turn it over um, quickly to Ralph um, to say a few words and then we'll uh, take any questions that you have. Yeah, so um, maybe just to, to clarify the position of uh, the university regarding the agreement um, as it stands here at Florida State. Um, so there was established um, an ad hoc committee in the faculty senate to review uh, whether or not the integrity of the university was compromised. And um, it's actually a great uh, report that they put out. It's on uh, President Barron's homepage, if anyone's interested in it. Um, they basically found uh, just a dozen points uh, where they took serious issue with um, the memorandum of understanding uh, between the Koch brothers and uh, the university. Um, but then, luckily, because of the ambiguous wording of whether the integrity was compromised, found that the integrity of the institution wasn't compromised um, because Although there were these uh, allowances for undue influence, none of them were yet exercised. Um, 
But in recognition of the existence of these allowances, um, the committee uh, the committee suggested that no new hiring be done uh, under this under this funding from the Koch brothers until the memorandum of understanding was updated. Um, so that was the recommendation that they kicked back to President Barron, and that's now his um, that's now his official position. How they're going to go about revising the memorandum of understanding um, has not been made clear to anyone. Um, whether or not the university has a hand in it, whether we're waiting from uh, Koch Charitable Foundation to come in on it. And uh, also, just to add, it's, it's not just between the Coach Charitable Foundation, it's also uh, between DB&T, uh, the bank. There are also um, co-writers on this. Um, so currently, the stance is, until this memorandum is updated, um, there will be no further hiring. And so what we'd like to do, um, and what we're in, in efforts uh, doing now, is putting a referendum on the ballot in the upcoming uh, student elections, as well as pushing a resolution through the student government, uh, student senate. Now, um, the Memorandum of Understanding says that Coke can withdraw their gift at any time if they feel like the conditions uh, of, the, of the university are uh, no longer friendly to their, uh, to their position. And so I feel like our efforts are to make the environment here as unfriendly as possible. Um, and so what we're hoping to do is, you know, the, the, the faculty senate spoken out incredibly sharply. Um, the punchline was kind of pulled for them. Um, but if we can get the student body to speak out, um, that's, we've got some some uh, petitions. If everyone would mind signing before we leave today, um, we need 500 signatures by tomorrow afternoon. So we'll have a fun night tonight. Um, but uh, I think starting Wednesday, um, unless something changes between now and tomorrow, um, we're going to be introducing a resolution on the floor of the Senate. Um, I'm going to be sponsoring, and I think uh, I've got a co-sponsor as well. And um, and hopefully we'll be able to mirror, uh, you know, the sentiments of um, faculty senate and President Barron within the student uh, student government. So that's just kind of where things stand now as far as FSU's um, agreement with uh, the Coach Charitable Foundation and BBT. Great, thank you, Rob. Mm -hmm. um, question <coughs> for any of our panelists. In the back. Uh, do the Coke brothers? I was um, I've talked to a lot of honors professors about this, um, and they kind of framed it that it wasn't that the department became libertarian leaning after funding, but that they chose to give funding because it was already libertarian leaning. Do they consider that when they're choosing universities to fund? Do they consider political leaning? Um, I mean, I, I imagine, I like, I, I, of course I'm not in their meetings, but I imagine, of course, like, of course you would kind of go there and, and just because it's, it's easier to kind of co-opt uh, departments that are not going to put up much resistance. Um, so in the case of our econ department, which is pretty hardcore right leaning, uh, these, abu these potential abuses of power weren't enacted mainly because the department was very right leaning. Um, but I, I, I think it's it's important to point out that it, it is absolutely co-optation. Um, one of one of my favorite examples of, of Coke's influence in education is uh, they built the Mercatus Center at uh, George Mason University with a uh, couple tens of million dollars millions of dollars they uh, put into that. And um, in '97, uh, the EPA was moving to reduce surface or moving to. Uh, uh, reduce surface ozone layers, um, or surface surface ozone, which is a form of pollution that comes from oil refiners. So Susan Dudley, uh, an economist with the Mercatus Center, um, very timely put out a report saying that reducing surface ozone would actually be bad because if there's less smog, more people will get skin cancer because more sun will get through. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and it's stuff like that that, that is used in, as justification in the legislation that's put forth. And I, I suppose a big reason why, I, uh, at least I personally took action uh, last May, was because I don't want my university to be used in that way. Um, because I, I do very much feel like a part of the, the academic community here. Um, I hope everybody else does too. And, and, something like that really deteriorates the quality of that and, and deteriorates the quality of what, what we have here. And I, I didn't want that. I don't, you know, co-op George Mason, but not Florida State, man, chop chop. I would just add to what, what Casey said. I mean, I'm not in their meetings either, but 
I think if you look at the list in the in the video that we showed of the universities where the Koch brothers have have put their their money in, and when you hear the things that Scott talked about about you know the the involvement that they have with every state legislature, I'm sure that they are happy to you know to grab at low hanging fruit. But I also think that the the influence of the Koch Foundation is so insidious at this point that it really is is everywhere. Other questions? It's just sort of an abstract question, not for any, any one of you in particular, but all my life I've been told about the importance of participating in civic activity, that as a citizen it's my responsibility to go out and vote, and occasionally I complain about things going on here in Tallahassee, and people say, you need to go and speak before the city commission, and, and so forth. Uh, and so this idea about civic participation seems to be sort of drilled into us. Now the Koch brothers have a lot more money than I do, and so maybe as a result they have a lot more influence. I would actually have gone before our city commission to talk. They give you three minutes and the commissioners look like they're completely bored. And you're like, you're wasting three minutes of my time after I sit down. And you know, maybe if I had the money of the Koch brothers they would listen to me or something. But, but my question is, I mean, where do we draw the line there where I'm, I'm educated, my, my, whole, my whole life people are telling me, you need to vote, you need to participate in politics, you need to get involved in groups, you need to go talk before the city commission. I mean, is it, uh, the Koch brothers seems like they're just doing that on a pretty big scale, but they have more resources than everybody else to do it. But where do we draw the line and say, you know, these guys are over the line, what, you know, what exactly are they doing? that puts them over the line where when I show up and talk before the city commission, that's my civic responsibility. And when they try to get involved to influence people, somehow that's over the line. Where, where, how do we define that line? Well, uh, for me, I would define it really simply as ethically, what are you doing? When you personally get up in front of the, the city board, are you denying you know, climate change? Are you, uh, you know, denying people's right to health care or public education? I consider those things immoral, and that's that's what they're doing. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not just it's not this like false dichotomy, this false equivalence between liberal thought and conservative or libertarian thought. There's things that are objectively <coughs> correct, and then there's lies that are disseminated to profit from, and that's their mo. So that's the line I would draw, first off. Second of all, you know, if you consider something like Citizens United, which is kind of a little bit of a tangent here, uh, you know, corporations are people, and it's, <laughs> you know, legally now. And uh, to kind of battle that with just, you know, ordinary people who have normal means or diminished means because of people like the Koch brothers in this agenda, it's difficult, but that wasn't really your question. But you gotta get out there. I think the line is never going to be really that clear, but I think the important part for us to remember, and I've been doing this since 1969 in some capacity, even when I was teaching. What they hope is that we will continue to be frustrated and stop. That's the goal here. So you won't want to go before a city commission. I won't want to go before the legislature. We just had a bill last week. The opposing side was given unlimited time. We were given two minutes and cut off at a minute and a half. And we could say to hell with it, we're done, this doesn't matter. It does matter because we're still here. And if they had their way, you would be indentured again. That's what they'd like to have. And I hope that's not offensive, but that is exactly what some of them would like to have. That you work for nothing and you do what I want you to do when I want you to do it. That's basically what they'd like to get back. They want to compare our education system to all the other countries. They don't do a damn thing to treat the United States students and its systems as you see overseas. But yet, that's what they want to compare you to. The sad thing about this whole thing with FSU and other universities, they're scrambling to find money and not raise tuition because they're raising tuition, as you well know, every damn time. There is no money coming out of this legislature. So universities, and I work with a lot of different alumni groups here, and I'm really proud of what y'all have done from the student perspective, too, because you put us all alums in a spot. The amount of endowments that's coming is not keeping up with what your needs are. 
So they're struggling to find this money. To Barron's credit, he didn't do this Koch brother business. It was done under Dr. Weatherall when he was president. It was still wrong for him to have done it, in my opinion. At least Barron recognized there's a huge problem here, and they, I don't know how the hell they're going to get out of it yet. That's going to be interesting to watch. But you can't stop. And that, I was so surprised. I thought if we had 10 people tonight, I'd be impressed. To have this many of you here willing to listen to this conversation and participate, it helps me go back and do this job again tomorrow. Because if you don't stick with it, they win. And I'll be damned if I, I will go to my grave having the same fight, because it's worth it. And you just have to continue. <laughs> I agree. You know where I would draw the line at? Uh, I completely agree, Jeff. And, and for me, one of the things that I think we need to look at when you talk about drawing the line is, when do you start hiding behind uh, fictitious entities created solely <laughs> by the state? <laughs> A corporation. When do you start hiding behind a corporate structure? And that's that's when you start to, to me, money isn't speech uh, and corporations are not people. Uh, and putting them on that same level, uh, that's when uh, problems really arise. I mean, the corporation only exists because the state allows it to exist. It's a pure uh, legal fiction. And yet you have the Koch brothers and, and the Waltons and, and um, these other billionaires like that hiding behind these corporate structures to uh, to influence people. If trust me, I, if David Koch came in front of my committee, I would I, I I would probably just pass out in the back because I wouldn't be able to believe it. Or Sam Walton showed up. Uh, it's hiding behind. To me, it's that line is drawn is when you're hiding behind corporate structures. When you have to have a, a corporation give you five million dollars to run an independent expenditure ad. Uh, named, you know, chocolates and bunnies and little kids. I mean, that's what they all name them. You know, it's America's future and America's workers. You know, by the way, you know, one of my favorite ECOs in, in, uh, in the state of Florida, and ECOs are basically state level 527, not to get in the weeds. It's called, what is it? It's like Florida Workers ECO. You know who owns that? Sugar. U.S. Sugar. Uh, to, uh, on the penny per pound uh, uh, issue. It was something like that, like Florida workers or something like that. And so when you're hiding behind fictitious entities to make people believe something, uh, that's where I draw the line. You know, the Florida Republican primary, you know, is next Tuesday. And we found out late this afternoon, sometime today, Damien, you don't know the points involved. Newt has bought $6 million worth of TV time for the remainder of this week. Now, I don't know if you know what that means, but if you don't, don't, don't want to watch, watch Newt, don't turn on TV because that's all you're going to see. <laughs> When Scott was running against Alex Sink for governor, he spent that amount for the last 12 days, 5.1 million. And if you remember that campaign, if you're paying attention, that's all you saw. I don't know how you buy that much time in the window that they've got. I mean, he's bought everything. So that's what you're up against. But you have to look inside and is it worth it? And clearly Casey thought taking this on was worth it. Didn't have to, could have gone on and done something else, probably been easier. Probably wouldn't have been looked as skewed by some of the administration at this point. But he chose not to take that route, and I think that's it's up to each of us. If somebody could help make a difference for you, now you gotta do it for somebody else. And that's just the way I've always tried to operate. And I, it serves me well, and I represent a group of people that want me to fight. And I don't mind trying to do it. Some days you don't feel like you win, won very much, but you were there. And the fact that you're there is important. So you just got to go back before that group, and they don't care. But every once in a while, we manage to take somebody out, and they begin to pay attention again. November is a huge election coming up. It's not for a governor. I'm not even talking about the Obama re-elect. I'm talking about in the state of Florida. These districts have been redrawn. Some of them will be a little more competitive. If you don't like what you've seen going on here, look who's been there. And is there a better alternative? And there may be in some cases where you want to vote for somebody else. And I don't care what party. I could care less. I'd like to have people. I'm a native Floridian. And I just would like people that value this state and the people who live in it. And that's the only litmus test that we need. <coughs> so hang in there. Glad you're all here tonight. I've got just a few minutes uh, past time we were going to wrap up. Are there any other questions before we do? Uh, so when I first heard this issue come up uh, a few months ago, uh, it seemed like the main issue was uh, the influence it had on the hiring process. Um, however, for me, it seemed kind of trivial where like most 
uh, grants are kind of assumed if you don't hire the right people, we're, we're going to pull the money next year or next semester or whatever else. Um, so, and most of the stuff said here seems fairly political, which I understand, that's obvious. Um, but would you guys be against this grant or this kind of funding or for the Cato Center, et cetera, if, uh, if there was no influence on the hiring process? If it was just money given to the, the institution, would you still be against it? I'll, Casey certainly can give that perspective. Uh, because I'm involved, a lot of the money giving that comes to FSU, it, all of it can be designated for program. This is the first time that I can recall. Now, there may be a gentleman's agreement somewhere. The guy that owns the antique race of cars down here, I can't even name his name, he gave a hell of a lot more than the Koch brothers gave. He has a definite influence on not only the university, but this whole community. But he didn't even ask to have hiring rights or veto rights if you didn't hire the right person. And he's given over $20 million. So yeah, he wants to influence the department, the business department, the economics department, whatever. But it's a whole different conversation when you literally say you've got the right to decide who the university will hire. That took it to another domain, in my opinion. Given the money, we'll take the money. And we do believe you ought to have the right to want to describe how you'd like to see the money spent. But when you cross that line to dictate the university, not only do I want it spent in this manner, I'm going to pick who's going to teach the classes, that's over the line. I think in the business department, I think that's a good point. I think, though, what we've seen outside of the Coke brother, we've seen is where the pharmaceuticals do the same thing in science departments. They may not dictate who... <coughs> Yeah, that's what I was referring to. Yeah, but uh, in, these, in the science departments and these pharmaceuticals, you start to see uh, almost a gentleman's agreement that, oh, yeah, we'll suddenly uh, research your product and suddenly we'll find it safe. I think there's always a danger there uh, of money coming from a corporation or their private sector if, if the money they're giving, uh, uh, the research or the, the activity at the university could have a return direct effect upon their corporate interests or their business, I, I always find that to be a danger, regardless of whether they, they actually dictate who they who you hire or not. And the science departments are where that's really occurring. Did, did any of you ever ride a yellow school bus to school? We have a bill to put advertising on the side of school buses <laughs> in this session. Huge controversy of which corporations can, what can the message be, blah, blah, blah. And we're missing the point. How so pitiful it is. is. You have Planned Parenthood, I can see that going on. <laughs> How pitiful it is that we had to go to put ads on buses to pay for education. But that's what we've come to in this state. The governor is putting a billion dollars back into education. Y'all see in those headlines? When you look at what he's doing, he is putting a billion dollars in. Now, he didn't tell you he took a billion six last time. But it's all earmarked. He replaces the Obama stimulus money so we don't lay off teachers. There's money in there for the 30,000 new students we're going to get. He replaces the property tax money. So when you get done, it's about $35 per kid new money. And by the way, he cuts hospitals uh, at the same time to do so. There is no new money in any of So he but kills grandma. Like, yeah, it is. <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I would just add, add to what Scott and Jeff said that you like, like, you know, I think they both gave us some good perspective. You know, I think it's important to look at the big picture of the influence that these organizations are having. And if you look at the money, if you look at the candidates that they are, that these corporations are funding, and their agenda, which in large part, just to look at this one example, is to uh, to uh, to take the funding away from public education. And then the Koch brothers, for example, come back to a university like FSU where they've been directly responsible for putting the people there that took the funding away from FSU. And then they come back once the university says uncle, then they come back and say, hey, hey, you know what, we'll help you out. Yeah. There's just this one condition. And I think that's, you know, and this goes back to your question too, I think that's where this really becomes insidious. But Ralph, did you want to? Um, yeah, I think it's a really great point. When we initially marched to President Barron's office, um, you know, he was talking about how, you know, well, we understand the, you know, the, the troubles with the agreement, but the department really could use the money. And uh, we brought exactly that up, and he acknowledged that it was, in fact, a little bit absurd that you actually be 
uh, helping the ideological goals of the people who are actually defunding the university in itself. Yeah. He, he acknowledges yeah. it right now. But I, I wanted to clear some things up. There's a lot more than just hiring power involved. And in, you're the agreement. I haven't pulled Okay, there's, there's a lot. Um, so That's just what I heard when I was here first. Right. right. So, uh, so no, there, there are quite a few things. Um, not only does it create um, a review board that reviews new hiring um, and has, a, has the potential to exercise veto power, um, but it gives uh, the Co-Charitable Foundation a hand in selecting the department chair. Um, it sets up um, it, it sets up uh, their own um, system of faculty evaluations, completely different from the university's evaluations. It's basically a measure of how close uh, faculty members' ideologies and their work right. um, line up with uh, Coke uh, ideologies. They guide, uh, they've created a course called uh, Market Ethics, um, <laughs> which uh, part, of, part, of, part of the grade is based around reading um, Atlas Shrugged. Uh, <laughs> um, and again, in an unprecedented sense, they uh, reserve the right at any point if the environment changes to withdraw all of their, all of their funding. So it's, it's, a, it's way more than just hiring, and, um, and the gift in and of itself is just fully uh, sort of ridiculous. All right, I guess I'm going to say on the uh, market ethics course, you can opt out of the uh, app show. Um, it's, it's true it's not required reading, but um, part of the grade is, is apparently based on if you miss less than four days, I think you have <laughs> there may be a particularity to that class. I know in my undergrad at uh, Florida Gulf Coast, they uh, have a similar co-foundation with DB&T, have a similar class called the Moral Foundations of Capitalism, <laughs> um, where everyone is provided their free copy of Ayn Rand, and it's a pretty large, I said, I said it a couple times, it's a pretty large part of the curriculum. Really if you want to know more about ALEC itself, you can go to alecexposed.org. And it is an unbelievably good website to get any and everything you want to know about them from other sources and just this old guy who went to New York. AlecExposed.org. Alec Exposed, one word. A-L-E-C. Yep, A-L-E-C. American Legislative Exchange Council. I just want to thank everybody for coming out. Thanks to our panelists, Casey, Scott, Jeff, Ian, um, to Amy for helping to put this together. And most importantly, to CPE and to all of you.